Perfect. Awesome. Well, welcome to the world of bat houses. Uh, my name is Dr. Kristen Lear. I am our Agave Restoration Program Manager here at Bat Conservation International. And uh, yeah, excited to share all about bat houses. Um, so I like sharing these pictures when I start because um, I unofficially got my start in bat conservation um, by building bat houses. Uh, this is me here in sixth grade uh, working on my Girl Scout Silver Award project uh, with my mom and dad and grandpa. Um, and we built bat houses, installed them in a park in Ohio. Um, and yeah, that was my first intro to bats. I will say, don't look at my example bat houses here. These are not how you should build them, um, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and then also since then, since sixth grade, been doing a lot of uh, bat house projects with communities, um, with universities um, and in the areas where I work and very excited to share about um, some of the work um, that we've learned of how bat houses are best to be put up, um, tips and tricks and how you can buy or build your own. So why bat houses? Why would we put up bat houses in the first place? Um, well, the first kind of component of why is mitigating habitat loss. So as we know, um, natural habitat is being lost around the globe. Um, trees are being cut down for development. Um, cave roosting sites can be disturbed. So obviously there are some places that need other roost sites, hence bat houses. And then also bat houses can be used even in areas that have healthy habitat for bat roosts um, to enhance that current roosting habitat available to the bats. Um, so, you know, they're good in that way. And then I show this picture here of a, an exclusion um, on a building. Um, so bat houses are great to use if you need to exclude bats from a building, say your house, and you want to still provide a roosting place for the bats so they're not homeless, um, you can put up bat houses before you do that exclusion, um, and then hopefully those bats will move into that bat house. So again, there are de definitely reasons why we use bat houses. And you know, why would we want to attract bats? Well, we benefit very, very immensely from having bats around. Um, they, oops, sorry, they, um, the main reason for putting up bat houses um, in terms of what bats eat are the ones that use bat houses are eating insects. They're eating things like moths and beetles, sometimes mosquitoes. Um, and those insects can be agricultural pests as well as garden pests. And so when we have these bats around, they help keep those insect populations under control. So it benefits us. Now I wanna go through some of the bat house basics. Um, there's a lot of information out there on the internet. Sometimes it's hard to know what's, what's right. Um, so definitely take a look at Bat Conservation International's website. We have um, a lot of this information on there, and we'll also be sharing this, um, this presentation afterwards, uh, link to it. So um, yeah, we'll go through the basics. What should my bat house look like? Where can I get a bat house? How should I install it? And where should I install it? When will I get bats? That's a very common question I get. Um, how can I tell if I have bats in my house, bat house? And then how do you maintain bat houses? So first things first, what should my bat house look like? There are several different designs or types of bat houses. We have the standard, <clears throat> excuse me, the standard bat house picture shown here, where it's a kind of flat bat house. Um, it looks like the standard skinny house, the bats roost up in the flats, and that's kind of the standard design. There are also these rocket boxes, which I really love. Um, they are a little harder to build, but the bats seem to really like them. And then of course you have, you might've heard of these bat condos, um, things like um, giant, basically giant structures where 40,000 bats could roost in one of these. Um, they're, they're really for areas that have tons and tons of bats. Um, in terms of the, the design, size is very important. Um, they need to be at least 24 inches tall or high and 16 inches uh, wide. And that ensures that there's enough thermal stability in that bat house that they'll um, not swing wildly in temperature and, and really hurt the bats. Um, and we encourage not to use the, the fabric or the mesh inside the houses. I know some, some groups use that, but we recommend not to because the uh, baby bats can get trapped up inside the mesh um, if it starts coming apart. Um, and in general, the more 
chambers, um, like you can see here, the more slats that a bat house has, the better. Um, because with more chambers, it gives more microclimate options. One of the chambers might be warmer, one might be cooler, and the bats can actually move around inside. So multi-chambered bat houses, two, three chamber or more are great. Single chamber bat houses tend to be less successful. Now in terms of color, I get asked this a ton. Um, what color should I paint or stain my bat house? Well, it doesn't really matter the actual color. The main thing that matters is the shade of color that you use. Um, and this map is from the Bat House Builders Handbook, which we will also link to. Um, and it provides, it shows a map of wherever you live, that should be the shade of color that you use. So if you're here in Southern Arizona where it gets really hot in the summer, you're gonna wanna paint your bat house white or a very light color. Versus if you're up here in the northern part of the U.S., you could probably you could paint your bat house black or dark brown. Um, so definitely, you know, check that out. Um, it's very regional specific. Um, and different bat species have different temperature preferences, as well as male and female bats. Uh, female bats tend to prefer warmer roosts um, to help raise their babies. So um, yeah, that's general guidelines. But again, you can play around with things. Um, in terms of painting or staining, using exterior grade latex based paints or stains um, is what you should use. Avoid those oil based um, materials. And of course, you want to caulk the seals well. Um, you don't want any drafts in the bat house. You know, just like us, we like a non drafty house. Same thing with the bats. Where can I get a bat house? Um, I see a lot of um, bat houses sold online on like Amazon or websites, but a lot of those houses that I see are don't meet the, the specifications of size. Um, usually size is the issue. Um, and so um, BCI on our website, we have plans if you want to build your own from completely from scratch. Um, there are some DIY plans on there, so check those out. And there are also um, several online vendors that I have personally worked with and would recommend their houses. Um, and again, we'll, we'll link to some of those websites um, on, on the, the post after this. Um, and, and again, just checking against the guidelines that we provide um, in terms of the size is very important. Um, if you have a, too small of a bad house, it's really not gonna be, usually not gonna be used. Now, once you have your bad house, you wanna put it up. Where should you mount it and how should you mount it? Well, building mounting is one of the um, one of the best ways, actually, uh, in terms of for the bats themselves. You can see here in this picture, there's um, the bat house is mounted on, on a wall outside. And these tend to be really well, very successful because these building mounted bat houses tend to be much more thermally stable than other mounting methods. So um, they tend to maintain their warmth or maintain their coolness and they don't wildly fluctuate in temperature. Um, and that's good for the bats is to maintain that stable temperature. Um, so building mounting is great. Pole mounting on either a wood post or a metal pole is also another pretty good option. Um, this is a little less thermally stable than building mounting, but um, I've had great success with this in the past um, with certain projects. So very, again, a very good, good way to do it. Um, and there are some um, tips on how to actually install poles in the ground um, from these websites here. And again, we'll, we'll, link, um, we'll link things. And then finally, the third option for mounting bat houses is tree mounting. Um, you can see in the picture here, attaching it to a tree. Um, we do not recommend this in general because um, they tend to be too, those sites tend to be too shady and not get enough sun. Um, and they're also a lot more open to predation. Um, snakes can very easily climb trees. Uh, raccoons can climb them and reach up into the house and pull out bats. Um, so we generally recommend against this. Um, if you do, if you do need to tree mount, you can use a predator baffle on the the base of the tree that can help prevent like a snake from crawling up the tree. Um, you know that can help. And then no matter what you're doing in terms of pole mounting or building mounting, um, the bottom of the bat house should be at least 10 feet off the ground, uh, but 12 to 20 feet is even better. 
Um, and the reason for that, as you'll see in this video, you can see the bats just drop out of the bat house when they emerge. So they need space to be able to drop and gain enough momentum um, and, and lift to be able to fly off. So you don't want to have it like super close to the ground because that would not be good for the bats. Okay, location, location, location. So say you're going to mount it on a pole. Where do you put that pole? Um, or on the building, which wall do you put it on? Uh, we recommend at least six hours of sun exposure per day. Uh, morning sun is fantastic if you can, because um, it helps heat up the bat house in the morning. Um, and again, clearance is a thing. We want to make sure that the bats can drop out of the bat house and have enough room to fly off without running into a tree branch or into a building. Um, so these are some of the numbers. 10 to 14 feet of clearance, again, on the bottom, and then 20 to 30 feet from the nearest trees. You don't have to stick to these exactly, but these are general guidelines. Um, and then south, south, southeast facing uh, tends to be uh, very successful in most uh, parts of the country, especially in the northern part of the country in the US. Um, but as I'll talk about later, you can play around with all of these things. And then if you can, if you have a water source, like a pond in your yard or a livestock water tank on your ranch, um, you but placing a bat house near these um, is great because they love to be able to drink. Uh, you can see this picture here, this little bat is swooping over the water to get a drink of water. Um, so they, they love being near, near water sources. When will I get bats? Um, this is one of those questions that of course you never know um, and patience is key. It can take a couple years uh, for a bat or a colony of bats to move into a bat house, even one that's like really well done um, and in the right spot. So leave it up for a couple years. If you don't get any bats, then you can start thinking about moving it around. Um, you can tell if you have bats, um, usually the presence of guano underneath the bat house. You can see here, I put little uh, tins under a bat house. This was part of my undergrad honors thesis work. Um, yep, they poop. So you can see, oh, there are bats up there. Um, sometimes you can hear the sounds coming from the bat house. Um, they, 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 I don't say chirp, they cheep a lot or, you know, they talk to each other. They're very social animals. Um, and if you shine a light very briefly, um, you can sometimes see them up there. And they're most likely going to be present in spring and summer into the fall, but likely not to overwinter in the bat house. Maintenance, um, bat houses tend to be pretty easy to maintain. Uh, just keeping an eye out for mud dauber or wasp nests and clearing those out whenever you uh, can. Obviously don't do that when the wasps are present, uh, but in the winter is a good time and check for the bats first before doing that. Um, just reapplying paint if it starts peeling off and recalking any seals if you need. But um, these bat houses here were in Texas and this was uh, 10 years after I installed them. Um, and they're still, I mean, you, they're still in good shape. They're paint peeling a little, but overall pretty good. Um, just quickly, some of the bat species, again, they're all insectivorous species, the ones that we have in the US that will, you will get in a bat house. Um, big brown bats, pretty common bat house dwellers in many parts of the United States. They're very common um, in residential areas, um, in, in towns. So big brown bats are one of the most likely uh, visitors. Evening bats in the eastern part of the United States often, <laughs> excuse me, will roost in bat houses. Mexican free tail bats, if you live in the southern part of the US, like Texas, you're going to get thousands of these bats um, that can roost together in a bat house. And then sometimes we'll get the more unusual ones, pallid bats will sometimes roost in, in bat houses in the western part of the US. Um, just briefly, um, I do want to talk a little bit about some of the, the hazards of bat houses um, and some of the considerations. There are concerns that sometimes we might be trapping bats in less suitable roosts than natural roosts. Um, you know, but bats aren't, they're not dumb. They, they will move around and they will find kind of the best roost. So um, usually we can mitigate that. Um, and then another question, do bats survive and reproduce well in bat houses? Um, do the pups that are raised in bat houses do as well as in uh, natural roosts? There's a lot of, excuse me, a lot of research trying to look at these questions. And in terms of some of the issues you might see, 
um, especially in the southern part of the U.S., but even in like Canada now, um, with climate change and changing temperatures, we are seeing some cases of overheating and heat stress in bat house bats. Um, it's called bulging bats syndrome, where basically the bat house is like bulging full of bats and they're starting to come out of the bat house during the day because it's getting so hot inside the, the house that they have to try to move outside a little to cool down. Um, and there are ways again to reduce this threat of overheating. You can install shade awnings over a bat house um, or cover in some way with shade to help cool them down. Um, so something to watch out for, especially if you're in the southern uh, southern climates. And another way that you can help mitigate these potential um, climatic risks is installing multiple types of bat houses or multiple bat houses in a location. Um, if you install multiple types, like a rocket box and a standard house, um, or you vary the location, um, some in sunny spots, one in a shady spot, or you paint them different shades of colors, by doing these different things, you can provide different microclimates within each bat house, and then the bats can choose each each day. Oh, I really want a warmer warmer place today, and they'll they'll move to the other house next door. Um, so it it really helps to have um, options for the bats. Or you can install back to back um, on on the poles in particular. You can see these uh, houses are installed back to back again, providing more temperature options for the bats. And in general, I really, really like to encourage when at all possible to think of bat houses in a community context. Um, if you're working on a school project or a scout project, or you have enough property where you could put up multiple bat houses or work with your neighbors, I highly encourage that. Um, when, we, when we provide multiple bat houses in different spots, painted different colors, that just provides a much better, uh, much better roosting habitat options for the bats. So again, thinking of a community mindset is ideal if at all possible. And key takeaways, again, microclimate, very important. Think about providing these different options and location is very important. Location, location, location. Um, you know, you wanna make sure to meet, meet the bats needs. Um, and again, we have all this information on the website and we'll, we'll share some links. Um, at the end. So I want to make sure we have time, plenty of time for questions, but um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and show you uh, two bat houses real quick, and then we can do q and I like, I, I like this video too. This is a little IR infrared scope. You can see two little bats roosting in, a, in one of the bat houses. Okay, let me stop sharing. Let's see. Okay. And just so a reminder for everybody, if you're watching on Zoom, go ahead and put your questions into the Q&A. We will get to those at the end. If you're watching on Facebook, you can put your questions into the comments and we'll answer those as well. And another reminder that the video will be saved um, on our Facebook page and also uploaded to our YouTube channel later. So if you're on Facebook, that's facebook.com slash BatCon. Um, if it's on YouTube, you can just search Bat Conservation International. And Kristen, I'll let you take it away. Awesome. I have the beautiful, beautiful blue bat house. So like I mentioned, color does not matter. You can paint it, you know, bubblegum pink, blue, whatever. Um, so yeah, color, it's more of the shade that matters. Um, but yeah, this is um, one of those uh, standard style bat houses that I mentioned. You can see it's kind of wide this way and then it's very thin this way. And inside you can see the chambers. So this is a three chamber bat house um, with three different rooms for the bats to roost in. Um, and I'll show the inside. And this one is from uh, Habitat for Bats. It's a Georgia based company that I've worked with a lot when I was living in Georgia. So um, very good, cool bat houses. Um, and then here, these are, they're, they're not super heavy, but they're hefty. Um, we can see inside the house. So this is a cutout. This is just a demo. So you can see what it looks like on the inside. So again, we have, this is a two chamber, you can see up in there, um, and you'll see that this is grooved, you can see the grooves there, um, or rough, roughed up wood. Uh, basically it gives, yeah, it gives the bat something to hold on to, and the bats will actually land on this landing pad, and then they crawl up into the bat house. Um, yeah, and then they roost there during the day, so 
that's the, the standard bathhouse, um, but there are other types out there. Okay, I wanna open it up for Q&A. All right, so um, we will do our best to get through everybody's questions. Um, also, we have added links um, in the Zoom chat and on the Facebook comments that link to the RBCI website um, section about bat houses and gardens. Um, in addition, we've linked to a couple of retailers that sell bat houses, and we have also linked to the bat house builders handbook. So um, if your question doesn't get answered for any reason, you have all of those resources available. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kick it off here. Um, somebody, Marsha, asked at the beginning of the webinar if um, noise disturbance would be a problem to bats like between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. when they're maybe trying to sleep. Great question. So the bats that will roost in bat houses are usually fairly, um, I don't want to say adapted, but adjusted to being around people. You know, they're in these kind of uh, urban or semi-urban environments. Um, so in general, like you walking around outside, even mowing grass, like occasionally it probably won't cause problems. Um, but if you're going to be doing anything really loud, like a lot, they might start getting um, perturbed and might move on. Um, but, you know, we've put bad houses in parks, we've put them uh, on the University of Georgia campus, and students are walking around all day, they're mowing grass occasionally, and, you know, they're fine. Yeah, good question. All right, um, we have another question from Emily, which is, um, do you have a, a recommendation for attaching bat houses to brick, like a brick building? Ooh, I, so I've never personally attached uh, bat houses to buildings. I've only ever done pole mounted ones, but um, the bat conservation and management website um, has, I believe they have uh, tips on doing that, on building mounting. Um, so check them out. Um, it's bat conservation and management. Um, yeah, and we might, I don't know if we still have um, any information on that, but the bat house builders handbook also um, could be a good source. Um, we have a question from Sheila. Can you use mesh in each chamber to give them grip? So we we recommend not using mesh um, because with mesh it is a good grip you know surface, but over time the mesh can start coming away from the house, and any baby bats that are raised in the house can, could crawl up under the mesh and get trapped. Um, and you know we have that has happened, so we recommend not using it. Uh, the best thing to do is to, um, to to rough up the wood really well or to create those little grooves um, in the in the chambers. All right, we have one from Valerie and I am just going to throw out there that I've never, uh, I don't do a lot of construction or building stuff, so I don't know what this is, but does building mounting apply even in southern Arizona or will will building mounting make the house too hot? I don't know what building housing uh, is. I don't know. If oh, know. building. I think uh, I think like putting it on the wall of a building. Um, oh, OK. Yeah. So, so I, I think, guess they're um, asking, would it would it be too hot if they put it on their house in Arizona? I, I'm glad somebody asked this because I meant to say um, with that south slash southeast facing recommendation, that is also adjustable. So if you live in a really hot climate like Arizona, it might actually be beneficial to put your house um, on a north facing wall um, on a building instead of south facing. That way it will help prevent it from getting so hot. Um, and so, yeah, um, I, I don't think building mounting is a bad thing in Arizona. It's just thinking about where, like which aspect or which angle you're going to put it at. And keeping an eye on things. I think that's important. If you do start getting bats, just check them out, you know, make sure they're not starting to crawl out during the day because that indicates it's too hot. And um, there's a second question here, which is, can you collect the guano and use it for gardening? Yes, you can. Um, it's a bat guano is a fantastic fertilizer. It um, it can burn your plants because it's so high in nitrogen. Um, so use it sparingly. But um, yeah, you sure, certainly can collect it. If you do collect, just wear you know like um, latex gloves or something, um, so you're not just like touching it like you would with any. <laughs> Any poop that you're handling, I know that sounds weird. Yeah, hopefully um, in general. But, you know, in general. Um, but yeah, spread it very sparingly on your plants and it's a great fertilizer. Um, and actually that reminds me with our, um, at, at BCI, we're, um, our Gardening for Bats program is something that we've more recently been working to promote 
in terms of creating gardens for these insect eating bats. So you plant night blooming flowers that attract nocturnal insects that our local bats can eat. And a really great way to marry bat houses with that gardening for bats is to plant a bat garden around your bat house or you know, underneath your bat house. You get the fertilizer from the guano. You have these night blooming plants that attract the insects that the bats eat. It's its own little like ecosystem. So that's a great idea for gardening. Yeah, you're giving them a home, food. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. We have a couple of questions on Facebook about cedar. If in particular cedar makes for a good bat house. Yeah, cedar definitely. It's one of the more uh, weather resistant woods for bat houses. Um, it is more expensive, so that's you know an issue sometimes with people doing small scale projects. Um, but yep, cedar definitely can be used. Um, all right, do bats have a preference between standing water or like moving water, like streams? Oh yeah, so standing water um, typically because two reasons. Uh, standing water is a lot easier for the bats to drink from. Um, you know, the bats will actually fly over the water and scoop up water with their mouth. So it's much easier when the water is not moving. And also standing water is great habitat for aquatic insects and also larvae of many insects. So if you have standing water, you can, again, create a food buffet for the bats at that water source. Um, can a rocket box be mounted to a building or only a pole? I'm sure it can be mounted to a building. I've never done that. I've only used them on poles, but I'm, I'm sure some ingenious you know, uh, person could figure out a way to mount them to a, a building. Um, typically they're, you know, they're built, the rocket boxes are built around a pole, but again, you can adapt it. Um, and that's the cool thing with bat houses is like, these are all ways that we've done it in the past and have been, you know, proven at least successful in most many cases. Um, but you can definitely try your own thing and then, you know, be creative. Um, okay, let's see. Do bat attract sprays work? As far as I know, there's no evidence that they do. Um, basically the idea with a spray is usually it's like a, a mix of the guano of bats with water or whatever, and you like rub it or spray it on a bat house to attract the bats to show, hey, this structure is a good roost. Um, yeah, again, I don't know if there's any evidence for that. And you, you know, if you don't know where you got the guano from, there could be like, you know, bacteria in it that could harm the bats. So you just want to be careful about you know doing that. Um, and bats are curious animals, if they see something go up in their environment, like a new bat house, um, if they're flying around that yard, they'll likely check it out. So um, yeah, they're just very naturally curious. Um, do you have any recommendations for like what to use to clean out the bat house? Yeah, so in terms of cleaning out, if there's wasps or mud dauber nests, um, in the winter, you can use a, just a long pole with like a ruler attached. That's what I've done in the past. Um, and just kind of whack out the nests of the wasps. Um, you could hose it out with a hose um, in the winter. But again, you have to make sure that there's no bats living in the bat house before you do that. Um, so just be careful. Um, if somebody has a pool in their backyard, would that count as a water source? It does, yes. And I've had, I've had so many stories people tell me of, oh, we were out playing in our pool in our yard and bats were attacking us. Um, they were trying to get water. They were trying to get a drink. Um, so yep, they will definitely use pools. I, I always wonder about the chlorinated aspect of pools and any long-term effects. I mean, I don't know if they drink enough water from the pool to make a difference, but I do wonder, but they will drink from it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a couple questions about the wasp. People are wondering if the wasps are dangerous to the bats and if they were to put up some sort of like wasp trap, would that mm -hmm. be dangerous to the bats at all? Any concerns there? Yeah, that's a great question. So the mud daubers are not dangerous to the bats. They, they, I've seen bats living with the mud daubers and with their nests in the same bat house and it's fine. Um, it's the paper wasps that are the issue because paper wasps will sting. Um, so yes, they could sting the bats. Um, and or hornets, you know, any nest like that. Um, and so, yeah, if you did want to put a trap, if you are getting the, the stinging 
wasp issue and it's becoming a problem in your bat house, um, yeah, you could definitely try a, a trap um, and it wouldn't affect the bats. Um, all right, let's see. Are there any bat houses that are for fruit eating bats or non-insectivorous bats? Not that I'm aware of. Obviously not here in the U.S. because we don't have any fruit eating bats here in the U.S. Um, but in other parts of the world, there are fruit bats and nectar bats. Um, but I don't know of any actual bat house structures that they use. Um, I do know in some places, um, some bat species will roost under the, the fronds of like palm trees. You know how palm trees get that big base of like dried fronds. Um, the bats will roost up in those. So I know some in some areas people are making like artificial palm trees where they're putting those fronds on a pole to help or, you know, some sort of structure uh, to provide roosting for the bats. Um, but in terms of bat houses, I'm not aware of any. Um, all right, we have another one from Anne. And this one is, in this particular instance, they have a barn, it sounds like, that the bats are roosting in. But the barn's only like 10 feet off the ground. Mm -hmm. So they want to know if they put up a bat box and it's only 10 feet off the ground, is that OK? Because the yep. bats are already doing that. Yeah, and that 10 foot, again, is a recommendation. Um, you will have instances of bats, like I've had bats roosting in like the chimney pipe or some sort of chimney structure on a house and the chimney structure is only like a foot and a half from the top from the roof of the house. And yet the bats still manage to get in there. So, you know, it's a recommendation. Um, yeah, the 10 feet, I'm sure you could definitely try. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then Virginia has a question about, you know, if there's guano and your your house is building mounted, is that like any sort of health issue? Mm, yeah, so um, with the guano, um, I always recommend not placing a building mounted bat house above a window in your house or above a doorway for obvious reasons, because yes, the poop goes down onto the floor. Um, and so I, I recommend, you know, less not high traffic areas where people are gonna be walking. Um, most of the time people just you know, sweep up the guano if they can tolerate it, they just sweep it up, uh, put it on their garden um, and shouldn't cause any health hazards. Guano, I mean, just like any poop, any guano from any animal, over time it can grow some fungus. And if you have a whole bunch of it, like a mound of guano and you're like rooting around in it and breathing in that dust, that can cause health problems, but a little bit on the floor shouldn't be a problem. But that being said, um, precaution is always best. So when you're, if you're sweeping up your guano, you could wear a, you know, a mask, cloth mask, um, can 95, um, just to be safe. Um, and then we have another question, which kind of goes into the temperature from Marsha and it's, she just wants to understand, um, is the best temperature range about 76 to 86 Fahrenheit? Or does it depend? And yeah. just kind of talking about how there's differences between torpor and stressful temperatures. Yeah, so it, de it depends. Um, so the female bats, when they're raising their babies, um, you know, mom bats give birth to one baby per year on for the most part. Um, and they need pretty warm roofs, like 100 degrees. Fahrenheit, um, sometimes even more. So 90 degrees. So actually hot is it tends to be well, um, well tolerated by female bats and their pups. Male bats tend to prefer cooler temperatures. Um, so yeah, and then winter, um, most of the time, especially in the northern part of the US or North America, uh, bats will not hibernate in bat houses because they're just, they're not thermally stable enough. So they go other places. Um, and so yeah, it's, but warmer is tends to be better for female bats. All right, uh, Ian asks, do bats prefer certain colors over other colors? Nope, they, they don't prefer colors. They, um, like I said, the, the color doesn't matter, it's the shade. Um, so yeah, you could paint, you know, bubblegum pink or blue. Uh, most of the like communities that I've worked with, people prefer <clears throat> um, like a brown or a green, something to blend into the environment, but the bats really don't care. Um, there's a lot of questions, so I'm just gonna kind of like rapid fire these. That's okay. okay, sounds good. Is a bird bath a big enough water source? Not generally, no. <laughs> they need they need the ability, it's like 10 feet long to be able to swoop down and drink. Um, how close does the water source need to be? If there's like a creek a quarter of a mile away, does that count? 
Yeah, quarter mile is great. Again, it's, these are all recommendations. You don't have to have a water body nearby, but quarter mile is great. Um, someone's saying that they wanted to put one near a cave, but they're worried about um, potentially like white nose syndrome. Yeah, yep. So white nose syndrome, for those who aren't familiar, is a um, disease caused by a fungus, an invasive fungus, um, excuse me, here in North America, um, that basically kills bats during hibernation, hibernation during the winter. Um, and it gets, grows on their noses, their, their ears, their wings, it eats away at the skin um, and wakes them up from hibernation. Um, and, and that fungus is found in caves. Um, and I, I actually need to catch up on the research with uh, the fungus being present in bat houses because I haven't kept up with that. Um, but the idea is that because it's a cold loving fungus, um, if your bat house is 100 degrees in the summer, it should kill off any of the, the fungus. Um, but, you know, the bats carry it around, so they, they could carry it around. Um, talking about sunlight, uh, this person said if, if the goal is six hours of sun, is that direct sunlight and then also morning mm -hmm. sunlight? Yeah, so yeah, the, again, that recommendation of six hours of yeah direct sunlight. Um, it might actually now be outdated. That was, you know, something 15, 20 years ago. But as we're seeing with climate change, you know, temperatures getting more extreme, um, you might adjust that. That's a good rule of thumb. But if you're only going to get four hours of direct sunlight or two hours um, in an area, you could maybe paint your bat house a darker color than you would normally um, to make up for that lack of sun or vice versa, paint it lighter if you get too much sun. Um, so yeah, there's things you can do to kind of tinker. Um, are bat houses needed more in urban areas or remote areas? Mm. Again, it depends. Um, in terms of need of, of bats and roost sites, um, the, the thinking is that where their natural roost sites are being lost, like people are cutting down trees or excluding them from buildings, uh, those aren't natural roosts, but you know, excluding them from buildings, that would be the area that has a higher need for artificial roosts. Um, so that could be in an urban environment or it could be in a rural area if they're cutting down a lot of trees, you know, um, yeah. And this might be kind of specific, but this person is talking about in the UK mm -hmm. that a lot of their bat boxes are on the trees, potentially because mm -hmm. maybe there aren't necessarily predators as yeah. much. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure why that would be, but I know in the UK, they have, the UK is like the ideal, my, my dream of bat work. Um, there's a ton of great bat work going on. Uh, the Bat Conservation Trust is one of the like great organizations working there. Um, and yeah, like, tree mounted houses might be better there. Different bat species live in the UK um, and yeah, maybe lack of predators. So again, I'm not saying trees cannot be used because it's definitely it's definitely an option. Um, and yeah, definitely everyone check out the UK bat house and bat building work. It's pretty awesome. We had, maybe you can just talk about this a little bit in general. Um, people who are maybe interested in having bats move from their home, like their roof or something to a bat box and just yeah. wondering if there's a way to also exclude bats from their home. Yes, so great question. Uh, we on uh, Bat Conservation International's website, we have information about excluding bats from buildings. So uh, Rachel, I'm sure we can get that link um, linked. Yeah. Um, basically, yes, bat houses are a great um, idea if you are excluding from a building. Uh, basically, what you would do is um, certain times of the year, not during the summer, because that's when the mom bats have their babies. Um, outside of that time frame, you can create one way, basically exclusion um, structures on the entry and exit point that's on a you know building. Uh, so find where the bats are entering your house, your your building. Um, put like a usually a mesh or some sort of cloth that they can get out of, but they can't get back in, or like a one-way funnel. Um, and then yes, if you put up bat houses like a few weeks before you do that exclusion, that will give the bats a chance to investigate the bat house that's like near near where the their building roost is, um, and maybe start moving in on their own. Um, or even if they don't move in on their own, they would know it's there and can hopefully move in once you do the exclusion. So definitely check out the website um, for tips on that. Um, is there a better time of the year to put up a bat house? 
So yeah, so um, you can put up a bat house anytime. Um, spring, like early spring is great because early spring is right before any of the hibernating bats come out of hibernation or any of the migratory bats migrate back to your area. And so if you get the bat house up in that time frame, it'll be there when they arrive in your area. And then they'll be able to investigate and be like, ooh, I like this bat house and I'll move in. Um, but I've put up bat houses in the smack dab middle of summer, like June, July, and they've moved in right away. Um, or I've put up bat houses at a great time and they've never moved in. So, you know, it's hit or miss. Um, but also ground is another, uh, the temperature of the ground. If you're gonna be pole mounting, it's a lot harder to dig <laughs> in the winter when the ground is hard than it is in uh, other times of year. Um, and is there a limit to the number of chambers a house should have? Nope, okay. no limit. Um, like those bat condos, like University of Florida has um, a couple bat condos. They've got like, I don't know, like a hundred chambers because they're huge. They're like 20 feet by 20 feet structures. And yeah, it's no limit. And do you think that light pollution would um, prevent bats from going to a bat house? Again, it depends. Um, light pollution definitely can be a problem for some bat species that are more, I don't want to say shy, but they tend to like foraging in darker areas. Other bat species, like the Mexican free tail bats that are in Austin, are very well adapted to urban environments and light. So I would not recommend putting a bat house like under a street light or in a very well lit area if possible um, to not, you know, scare the bats, but also predators like owls um, can see the bats a lot better if it's well lit and can can catch them better. So yes, I wouldn't put it right in a bright light, but don't worry too much. And I did just want to add to somebody noted if you have a pool, maybe put a frog log or a little mm. escape ramp for bats and other wildlife that might go in there. Thank you for mentioning wow. that. Yes, bats can swim. They, they basically like swim like they fly. Um, so they fly in the water basically. Um, and yeah, they, they can get out if they have a ramp, like they said, and the ramp should have like a sides to it so that they don't just swim under it um, and they can crawl out. Thanks for that. Yeah, and this is gonna be the last question because we've had a couple, which is just about um, flickers, woodpeckers and birds kind of disrupting bat houses. Any <laughs> recommendations there? You know, I've, I've never encountered that problem um, in all my time building bat houses, but I'm sure it could happen, but but the, the thing with bat houses is they're, they're open bottom. So birds can't actually roost in them really like because they're open bottom. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think that's an issue, but if anyone has experience with that, I'd love to, to hear about it. Um, and then also one thing before we wrap up, I did want to mention um, DIY kits for bat house making. Um, you know, if you want to build your own from scratch, you can, we have plans on online, but there are also a couple um, companies or organizations that have kits that are, they're already pre, the wood's all pre-cut, they provide the screws, um, you just have to, you know, put it together. Um, and those are great for like scout projects or, you know, school projects. I've had kids as young as five helping build those, um, and they're really fun, uh, like hands-on activities. So uh, we'll link to those two, um, to those websites. Yeah, I will add that on Facebook um, and then we will add all of the links onto the YouTube video when that gets uploaded as well. That should be by tomorrow. So um, we are going to wrap it up. And I just want to say that a lot of the questions that we didn't get to looked like they were questions we had already answered. So if you still have questions and you maybe came in halfway, you may want to start from the beginning and also check out those resources that we did link to because I think that those will answer a lot of your questions. Of course, we have more information about bat houses, bat gardens, um, and what to do if a bat is in your home on our website. Um, and so you can go there, batcon.org. Um, we also have a frequently asked questions if you have other questions. Um, in general, we're also on social media. So I encourage you to follow us there. That way you can learn about more of these webinars and events that we're having. Um, and you can ask questions on there as well. Unfortunately, we don't necessarily have the capacity to answer everybody's um, specific bat house questions. So we apologize for that, but we will do our best uh, to answer any other questions that pop up on the Facebook video and on YouTube. So I uh, just want to thank everybody. This uh, was 
so great. We had a wonderful turnout. I know this is a really popular topic. I want to thank Dr. Kristen Lear for um, being an expert in this area. So Kristen, thank just you. So, so grateful that you were able to take uh, the time and energy to do this. And Kristen is actually our Agave Restoration Program Manager. And if you want to learn more about that program, which has almost nothing to do with bat boxes, I don't think, um, you can check out our website and learn more about that. That's a really great program, too, that has to do with nectariverous bats and, um, and agave plants. So thank you all, and we will see you at the next one. Thanks, everyone.